Thanks for having me today. It's exciting to be here. I work uh, in that uh, bright, shiny building over there, which is the MRC Lab of uh, Molecular Biology. So I'll bring to you a, bit, a more molecular uh, view on, on Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease actually is a, is a member of a, of a family of neurodegenerative diseases called uh, tauopathies. And these are characterized by uh, the in inclusions, aggregates of, of tau in, in the brain. And Alzheimer's disease is by far the most uh, common one. And the only one where then you also have this amyloid beta aggregation, which uh, Leo uh, just mentioned. All the other tauopathies is just tau going. Uh, going strange. So other examples are Pick's disease, uh, cortical basal degeneration, etc. And if you now look at brains post-mortem from people who've died of these diseases, they are at a histological cellular level very different. So it's the same protein going wrong, but uh, the, the uh, effects on the brain are very different. Also different areas of the brain are affected in the different diseases, uh, leading to different uh, symptoms. Now, at what we think what, what part of what, this, what is related to all this is the aggregation of tau through a process called seeded uh, aggregation. So if you look at the aggregates of tau in the brains, and then you can isolate these uh, helical filamentous long arrangements of aggregated protein. And if you would shine x-rays on them, uh, then you get this typical cross beta pattern, which has, a, which has uh, uh, features of or 4.7 angstrom, half a nanometer, if you like, uh, which is the distance between beta strands in uh, if you pack uh, proteins on top of each other. So these filaments basically form beta sheets along the helical axis, and um, these then pack against each other, giving rise to a 10 angstrom packing distance as well. Now, in human brain, there are six isoforms of tau, and the longest, the, the full-length tau protein is 441 uh, residues. Now, that contains four microtubule binding repeats, R1 to R4 here. And these repeats, tau uses these repeats to bind to microtubules. And it's normal, happy life. This is what tau is supposed to be doing, stabilizing microtubules in the neurons. But then there is this kind of aggregated unhappy state, uh, which uh, happens in disease. Now, interestingly, the, Due to splicing, you can have uh, three isoforms where uh, only three repeats are present because X and 10 can get spliced out. So then you get so-called three repeat tau isoforms. And if you now look at the tau inclusions from Pick's disease patients, you'll find that they only uh, contain three repeat isoforms. And for example, if you look at CBD, then these have only four repeat isoforms. Whereas in Alzheimer's disease, you have a mixture of all six uh, isoforms from the brain. Now, you can then look Using electron microscopy, and this work was done in the 90s by Tony Crowther, Michelle Gooder, when we're still uh, uh, on the other side of campus, uh, but at the LMB as well, you can see that morphologically the filaments are actually different in the different diseases. And more recent work uh, by a group in Japan has found if you do limited proteolysis, you can, you can treat these filaments that you extract from brains with proteases and kind of eat away because already Tony saw in the micrographs that surrounding the filaments, the ordered structure is a whole fuzzy coat, he called it. And this is part of tau protein not being ordered. And you can just eat that away by uh, limited proteolysis. And then the Japanese group found that different areas all surrounding these repeats, but in the different diseases, different areas are actually ordered inside these um, amyloid filaments. Now, um, Throughout the development of disease, amyloid seems to be spreading. It starts in one area of the brain and then spreads to uh, different areas. And it is hypothesized that seeded aggregation of these amyloid filaments is the, uh, the mechanism by which this happens. So if you have a small filament of aggregated tau, then this can convince the happily mostly unstructured or microtubule bound molecules of tau to join in and bind to the filament, making it longer. If that filament then breaks into pieces, then you have many more growing ends, and this can then uh, become an exponential process. So Michelle Goodert, my uh, very close collaborator at the LMB, uh, did these conceptually uh, beautiful experiments where he has a, a mouse model with a human tau overexpression. And if you inject the um, brain extract from patients with different tauopathies into these mice, you can actually see that the 
pathology specific to that disease will develop in the mouse. So this kind of adds to this model where, where the tau protein itself can be in some form uh, infectious, if you like. So that is kind of reminiscent to the, the prion hypothesis for prion diseases. Uh, and the question then is, does tau be behave like a prion? And then in, in prions, you have the concept of prion strains, where there's different conformations of the same protein leading to different types of filaments, that, which then each can lead to the different forms of the, of the disease. So how that would work was completely unclear for tau. And we thought that structural biology, looking at the three-dimensional arrangements of atoms in the protein, might, uh, might be of help. So this is a project, as I said, in very close collaboration with Michelle Goodert. Tony Crowther is still around and helps us a lot. And it was initiated by a postdoc in my group called uh, Anthony Fitzpatrick. So on the left here, you see a slice of a brain from a 74-year-old lady in the US who died of advanced uh, Alzheimer's disease. And you can see these big holes like uh, Leo had a similar on his. Uh, his slide. Now you can look at the uh, tau enclosures in, in light microscopy and then you can isolate using sarcosyl solubilization, you can isolate these tau filaments from uh, pieces of frozen brain. And then you can do negative stain and already Tony in the 90s had seen that there's two types of filament. One is paired helical filament which are kind of wide and narrow and wide and the other ones are called straight filament because they have a more or less constant uh, width here with the green arrow. Because I thought I'd go to APCAM, I'd throw in one, <laughs> one slice of antibodies. I'm afraid they're not from APCAM, at least. I don't think so. But uh, we, they were raised by Michelle and, uh, and collaborators. So, but you can do antibody binding to these filaments. You can, you can do amino gold labeling, for example, and then see if, if, the, if the epitope is accessible to the antibody. It's probably part of this fuzzy coat, because once it's, it's formed in this amyloid-like structure, then it's not accessible. So you can probe with antibodies which parts of the protein are actually involved in the uh, formation of these, uh, of these uh, filaments. Now, in electron microscopy, a whole revolution has taken uh, place over the past six years or so. And uh, this has to do with better microscopes, better detectors, and better image processing uh, software. And we can now image these filaments extracted from the brains of, of people who died with these diseases in a uh, water-like uh, environment, which is, uh, which is frozen to be compatible with the uh, environment in the electron microscope. And these are the images. Now then, we used software. My own personal expertise lies in algorithm development, and uh, we make software to process these cryo-EM images. And Shauda, he's a PhD student in my group, had kind of expanded our software to deal with helical symmetry, which is present in these uh, uh, amyloid-like uh, filaments. And we used Shauda software to then solve the structures of these paired helical filaments and straight filaments from the brain of an Alzheimer's patient using cryo-EM to resolutions which are then sufficiently high. So the, the, the kind of blue cloud that you see is the reconstruction of the three-dimensional scattering potential of the packed protein. And that's of enough detail that you can build an atomic model uh, for how the uh, tau protein arranges in these filaments. So this is the paired helical filament. It's now an XY cross-section. So this is one copy of a tau pro protein and part of a, a copy of another tau protein. Now this now, another protein will come onto this, pack in a beta-stranded way 4.7 angstroms out of the plane, but by doing so it will rotate slightly, about one degree. And by doing this many, many times it will kind of tumble over. So that's why on this side of the image you can see that the whole thing becomes a twisting. And then in projection these were wide and narrow. That's because this molecule packs in a way which is more, much wider than it is high. So it depends on which direction you're looking at, whether these views will be high and narrow. Now the straight filament is kind of straight because it's more or less as high as it is wide. But you can see it's made up of the same uh, two C-shaped like what we call protofilaments and two copies of these proteins involved and only residues 306 to 378 of the 441 that full length tau is are actually ordered in the core of these Alzheimer filaments. So that means there's 305 residues flopping off on this side kind of randomly and 70 on the, on the other side. 
Now, the C's in the two uh, protofilament uh, from the straight and the paired helicals are the same. And then you can ask, well, that was this lady. How about the next patients with Alzheimer's disease? Will it be the same or is it somehow different? To answer that question, we looked at another three cases of AD in cryoEM. And in total, we looked at about 20 cases using this negative stain imaging and the amino body the immunolabeling in EM that I just showed you examples of. And the, the, the conclusion is that we think that if you have Alzheimer's disease, you will have these kind of uh, tau filaments in your brain. So we think this is common for Alzheimer's disease. They do explain why the, there, is a, there can be a mixture of both three and four repeat isoforms. I told you that it was the second repeat would could be spliced out. So three repeat go straight from this valine to this lysine, whereas the full length uh, goes here and, and, and incorporates the whole second repeat. Now, because this second repeat is part of this fuzzy coat, it's not ordered. It doesn't matter whether it's present or not. So you can incorporate all isoforms uh, um, can be incorporated as, as likely as any of the other. Now, that's not true for PICS disease, so we thought it would be interesting to look at a, a PICS patient too. So this work was done when Anthony left. He's now an assistant professor at Columbia University. It was taken up by uh, Ben Falcon, a postdoc in Michelle's lab, help, with help from a postdoc in my lab called Wen John. And this is the brain we use. You now have kind of spherical PIC bodies, again, made of tau aggregates. And we could see narrow and wide filaments. And the XY cross-sections, again, the perpendicular to the helical axis cross-sections, uh, show a very high resolution, again, of, of, the, of the narrow one. And then for the wide, resolution was very low because we didn't have many of them. But I hope you can see it's kind of a head-to-head -head packing of the narrow one. So the narrow one, again, was good enough to build an atomic model. And if you now look at the model, remember, this is three repeat tau only. So the second uh, microtubule binding repeat is not there in these proteins. So the structure goes from V. It now extends beyond. Uh, the third repeat all the way into the first repeat. And this then explains why in PICS, um, in PICS disease you only have three repeat isoforms because the four repeat isoform of tau, it might still be present in the brain, but it cannot incorporate into these filaments because these residues here are all different between the first repeat and the second repeat. And some of the residues would be too big, they would be bumping into each other. So there's basically no space to put a four repeat tau isoform protein into this structure. Now, uh, the last disease I'll, I'll talk to you is, uh, and, and Leo mentioned environmental factors. This is the only tauopathy with extremely clear environmental factors. We don't really know how it works, but if you are um, unwise to voluntarily or involuntarily expose yourself to repetitive head trauma, then you're at risk of de developing a disease called chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And for those of you uh, interested in American football, for example, it was, was it, it's a big thing in the US. And also here, headers of, of normal English football players uh, might develop this. So we had. Uh, brains from two ex-professional boxers and an ex-professional American football player and did the same trick again. Now in CTE, just like in AD, you have a mixture of three and four repeat tau isoforms. And interestingly, we see structures which are kind of C-shaped, although the C is uh, more open. Again, for the same uh, disease, all the patients had the, had the same uh, filaments, but these are now different from the ones in AD. Already the ones in PICS disease were very different from the ones in AD. CTE is not that different, it's the same residues involved, but the C kind of opens up. And we see, interestingly, an extra density inside an otherwise hydrophobic kind of greasy cavity. So what we think is there's some kind of hydrophobic cofactor involved. It's no longer just tau assembling in these filaments, but uh, some kind of as yet unknown hydrophobic molecule, which may help to keep this, this cavity uh, open and, and, and make this structure rather than the AD structure. We don't know what's cause and what's consequence. Uh, so this then raises an interesting question. Tau aggregation, you could think, oh, it's just kind of a sink of tau to go in and disappear or whatever. But why are there these specific folds, specific conformations of tau in each of the, of the diseases? And we have no clue why that happened. At the chemistry atom level, there must be some very strong specificity to only form structures of one type and not of the other type in, in disease. 
So we want to understand how that works. And for that, it would be really useful if we could make these structures in vitro, because then you could, you know, you could make antibodies for them, or you could you could think of all kinds of tools. But um, the the only well, the most famous way that people make tau filaments in vitro, and it's used, for example, it, uh, at, I was at GlaxoSmithKline two years ago, and they told me they have big multi-million compound screens to inhibit tau aggregation using an assay where you add heparin to overexpress tau. And then spontaneously tau forms in the test tube into filaments. And that's good because if you just have tau itself, it's extremely soluble. It will not aggregate on its own. So when John in my lab then decided, okay, I'll repeat that and I'll do that. And then I'm going to look at these structures and see whether they're the same. And already you can, she made both four repeat and, and, and a three repeat tau isoform in E. coli, added heparin and looked at it in the microscope. And already you can kind of see the structures are very different. There's four different types of structure for four repeat and, and the three repeat tau is, is more homogeneous. But uh, she then went on to do uh, structures or four of these. And these are shown here now in, in kind of schematic overview he, down here below. So we had the CTE structures, the AD structures, the PIC structures, all of them different. Each disease has its own, but our in vitro models don't capture any of the, the, of the diseases. So that's a problem. And it raises question, what leads to these different filaments in disease? Heparin kind of acts as a cofactor to make uh, these kind of structures. Are there different cofactors in disease that, that help tau? Or are, is tau itself modified? Uh, Post-translational modifications of tau might make, make different chemically different tau in each of the diseases. All these things uh, need to be uh, studied and what we would like to do next is to also look at these four repeat tauopathies. There is, there's many members of that family. Possibly the second repeat is involved in, in structures there. But ultimately, what we really want to do is develop methods where we can make AD-like filaments or CTE filaments in the test tube. Because if we can understand how we can make one but not the other and, and be specific, then hopefully we will learn what's important for aggregation, which might hopefully ultimately, after many years, lead to uh, possibilities, new possibilities for therapeutic intervention. So, each disease has its own fault. Uh, in vitro models currently don't capture these. And, and Lee also mentioned mouse models. Michelle has a, has a tau mouse model, and we're looking at structures there as well. And again, these are different from the ones we see in disease. We're not there yet with a true structure, but already we can see that the filaments look different. So, is this the reason why mouse models are not good models for human disease? That we don't know yet, but at least we can see there are actually molecular aspects of these models which are different from disease. So what we also learn in general, and this will hold for alpha-synuclein and it will hold for other proteins like TDP43, that amyloid structures are actually very versatile. The same protein, the same amino acid sequence can fold up in these very wildly different uh, shapes, which are the amyloids. So, a lot of work has been done on in vitro aggregated structural biology of alpha synuclein TDP43 amyloid beta. And I think we need to go back and look at brain derived material because it could very well be that just like with tau, that in the brain things are very different from what happens in the test tube. For me as an image processor and, and, a, and a cry electron microscopy, it's now very exciting. We can take actual human tissue from specific diseases and solve atomic uh, structures uh, with these and I think uh, these methods will be applicable to uh, many more diseases. So that's it. Thank you very much. So well, thank you. Fantastic talk and um, yeah amazing to think of the science that's going on in our building over there. <laughs> some, of the, some of the things your team have unlocked and as you said many times it's, it looks like the gateway to many other aspects of understanding the disease and looking at it crosses over with other neurological conditions. So fascinating space. Anyone have any questions? Some of the scientists in the room must have a few up their sleeve. <laughs> I'll put them under pressure now. Leo, you can start. I, I have one. Uh, people with Alzheimer's or with other droplets can have mixed pathologies in their brain. Yes. You see that in the filaments as well. We think so. So one of the CTE patients, I think the American footballer actually had a low percentage of PHFs as well. So they were 
only a few and it was a bit hard to detect, but we could detect some, so which did not have this. So we think that might be a comorbid comorbidity. Yes. Yes. Like yes. What it could also be is some of them might have TDP 43 or so, but that we, we didn't specifically uh, look for. <coughs> so um, you mentioned that um, AD picks and started by no, have, CBD. Have distinct, have CBD, have this yes. distinct tau sort of formation each. Yes. Do you think, obviously you mentioned in the previous talk that we're not sure what comes first amyloid or tau or how it interacts. It would appear from what you're saying that tau is almost the, a very <laughs> starting point for these diseases? Or is that... So starting point, I think there is good genetic evidence in AD to say that AB a beta could be the starting point. So you, if you have genetic, uh, if you have mutations in the amyloid precursor protein or in gamma secretase, which cuts it to generate these amyloid beta peptides, then you will get Alzheimer's disease. So that kind of genetically, is, I think, is quite strong evidence to put A beta first. Now, nobody go, knows how you go from A beta aggregation to tau aggregation. But your observation is correct. So tau aggregation alone, you don't need A beta to, to, be, to have neurodegeneration. So tau on its own, uh, and that could be, for example, through knocks on the head in CTE or through whatever other factors in, in the other diseases. But tau aggregation on its own will uh, can lead to uh, neurodegeneration as well. And but you're, you're more of an expert. What I understand is that the amount of amyloid beta aggregation one has in, in the brain does not correlate very well with cognitive decline, whereas I understand for tau that is more so uh, the case, right? So you talked about cofactors. Um, what should we expect from the ones that are currently being studied? <laughs> That's a very good question. So. We're kind of doing explorative work. These are dirty preps because we start from a few grams of brain and we ultimately want to identify one or perhaps a mixture of a few similar types of molecules. So these are difficult experiments. We're trying, we're working with the metabolomics mass spec department here in the hospital, for example, uh, trying to immunopurify antibodies, uh, our uh, filaments to have as pure samples that we can such that we don't get too many false negatives. But so for the, for the hydrophobic ones in, in CTE, we had been, and now this becomes hypothesis and speculation, uh, but we had, so if you look at the kind of cavity, it's mostly hydrophobic and there's a few polar groups of serines that stick in there. So we thought cholesterol-like molecules might fit in there well and steroids are mm, cholesterol-like. So then we thought, oh, you know, and then the American football player had used steroids and so on. So it's, oh, perhaps, well, that's t spicing up as a story. But <laughs> the, the two boxes are actually two of the most, the oldest known cases of CTE kind of studied in the literature. And they died before any steroid development was, uh, had happened. So it's, it, it wasn't that spicy a story. But uh, <laughs> molecules like that, or fatty acid chains, perhaps, we don't really know. We have basically no clue. All we know is more or less the size and that it should be mostly hydrophobic because of the environment of tau that it's provided. Inflammation, because my first talk was inflammation. Anyway. Yes, we have no clue. <laughs> yes. Right, so sorry to hear that you were using other companies antibody I'm sure we well I think most of the antibodies we use are kind of academic ones which are made right. by people so in the my labs. question is, um, uh, is that from my memory many moons ago so uh, in the field I, I guess there was an, a question around the pathological symptoms of uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's uh, showing this uh, um, tau tango and um, uh, amyloid plaques and then whether that is the cause of for the disease or actually that's the symptom, the out mm. outcome from the disease. Yes. And then for drug discovery purpose, I think, I think that will have a very different uh, drug discovery strategy around that. So what's the current view on that? I think the final verdict is 
still out, especially what would be useful as a, as a drug target because there is no known drug that actually works. As I said, I think genetic evidence for amyloid cascade is very strong. Uh, um, then kind of what the only new light we shine on this is not a, not a true answer to your question, but some people said, oh, it's just a dump. So uh, something goes wrong with protein homeostasis. How happy are your proteins in, in degenerating neurons? And then there's just a lot of tau around and perhaps a lot of amyloid beta peptides. And then they just can, kind of get dumped into these plaques and into these, uh, into these tangles. And it's just kind of a waste product. Now, I would say if that were to be true, then I, 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 I find it hard to kind of coincide that with, with the observations that these structures are actually very specific for each disease. Because if it would just be a waste product, why would you fold it up in such a specific way? Why would that happen is not clear to me at all. But, you know, I don't have any true answers to your question yet. <laughs> Yes. Can you talk a bit more about that, perhaps? Yeah, so, uh, oh, that's not Sorry. time. No, no, don't worry. Um, so there is phosphorylation size. Hyperphosphorylation seems to play a role in tau aggregation, or at least these tau tangles, tau is hyperphosphorylated. Whether it plays a role or not is still under discussion. But there are distinct patterns of phosphorylation in the different diseases. Now, inside the ordered cores that we've resolved to date, n we see no post-translational modifications at all. And, uh, but in the fuzzy code, post-translational modification differences are present between the different diseases. Because we have no idea how the initial event happens. We only look at kind of the end stage events of, of disease, right? What we're really after is how does that first little filament, if this seeded aggregation model is true, what we really want to know is how does it all start? How do those first few assemble and you, from there on it kind of all uh, goes pear-shaped? So what role the fuzzy code and post-translational modifications might play are, is completely unclear. But there are differences between the different diseases, yes. Excellent. Thank you.